and this week's sermon is going to be on the topic of the rapture, the rapture of the church. Now, there are many people today, many of them all over YouTube, that say there's no such thing as the rapture. For us as followers of Christ, the rapture holds a special place and we are all aware that it is going to happen one day. Yet, there are some people who still claim that there is no such thing as the rapture. To figure that out, we are here today with this video where we'll be diving deep into everything that you need to know about the rapture and when this true event is going to take place. You might want to send this video to family and friends who still don't believe a rapture is coming. Arming yourself with God's word as your knowledge might be the right thing to do for you today. So without any further ado, let's get started. First of all, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Those who are against the rapture and say there's no rapture whatsoever, they cry aloud, the word rapture is not in the Bible, so it's not a Bible doctrine. Well, you know, the word trinity is not in the Bible either, but it is a Bible doctrine. The Trinity is one God with three parts. You can prove that easily from the scriptures. God is one God with three parts. And instead of the word Trinity, the Bible uses the word Godhead. The Godhead is one God with three parts. So just because a word is not in the Bible doesn't mean that the doctrine is not in the Bible. There are some teachings in the Bible that men have, have put a name on. And the word rapture is a word that men have made up to refer to the time when Jesus takes out the church. This is the first one, the pre-tribulation rapture, which is, of course, the teaching that the rapture takes place before the tribulation period. The second one is the mid-tribulation rapture, which people today believe that the rapture is not going to take place before the tribulation. They say it takes place in the middle of the tribulation. Then you have number three, the post tribulational rapture, which is kind of weird, where people think that the rapture is going to take place at the end, the very end. Breaker starts his sermon with a very important point that is about the different kinds of views that are there regarding the rapture. The term rapture refers to the eschatological event in which both dead and live believers are caught up. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 together in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15.52, to meet Jesus in the air. The term rapture is derived from the Latin for to seize, snatch away. The rapture, then, refers to the hope of the resurrection of all Christians who have died, as well as the simultaneous transformation into a glorified body for those who are still living when Jesus returns. While the resurrection of Christians is a long-standing Christian teaching that is securely anchored in Scripture, the term rapture first became popular in the 19th century with the rise of premillennialism and dispensational theology. Now, in Breaker's opinion, there are different views which are centered around the rapture and which have to do with the timing of it, such as, according to this viewpoint, the rapture occurs when Jesus comes secretly to gather the church before the seven-year grant tribulation that precedes Christ's return to earth. This theory is similar to the pre-tribulation perspective, with the exception that it places the rapture after the first three and a half years, at the moment when the Antichrist takes control. According to this viewpoint, the rapture will take place near the conclusion of the tribulation, before God's anger is unleashed with the bold judgments, Revelation 16 before Christ's second coming. This view sees the rapture as occurring simultaneous to the return of Christ at the end of the tribulation. Although there are serious differences between the first three views of the rapture, they all share the same perspective that the rapture is a separate event from the second coming of Christ. As such, it is crucial to address the question of whether or not the rapture is a separate and distinct event from the second coming of Christ or if it occurs simultaneously when Christ returns to earth at the end of the tribulation, which is being described by Breaker here. God did promise to come again, even in chapter 14 again of John. John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world giveth, 
give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Verse 28. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away, and come again unto you. If you love me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. So Jesus says, I go away, and I come again. When he comes again, he comes at the rapture to, to do what? To take them unto himself. That's what the rapture is for. We who are saved, we will go up with Jesus to our mansions in heaven when he comes at the rapture. Here, Robert talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ, but in a detailed and brief way. He mentions the important points from the book of John, where Jesus himself talks about the fact that he will be coming back soon. Following his resurrection, Jesus returned to heaven, where the disciples watched him ascend into the sky. The Bible says, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Now what does it mean? There are two important points that stand out in these verses. First, the Jesus who returns to earth the second time is the very same Jesus who lived here on earth with us and went back to heaven following his resurrection. And second, he will return to earth the same way, in like manner, as he went back to heaven. How did Jesus go to heaven following his resurrection? Did he go secretly? No. The disciples watched him rise, literally, bodily, into the air until a cloud hid him from their sight. So these verses tell us that Jesus will return to earth the same way, not secretly, which is also being pointed out by Breaker here. Paul taught the doctrine of the rapture to brand new believers in the Thessalonian church, indicating that it is an important doctrine. He wanted them to know about the reality of the rapture in the midst of a difficult life because it was designed to be comforting, not a point of division among believers. On the one hand, the second advent involves Jesus coming back to judge a Christ-rejecting world. On the other hand, the rapture is a rescue operation designed to be a comfort to a believer's heart. At the point of the rapture, all believers will receive new bodies, the body that God intended for us before sin. The body that we have now is not fit to experience eternity with God. This body we have now is temporary and worn out. Heaven is eternal, and we must have a resurrected body to spend eternity with God. Romans talk about how we groan for the redemption of our bodies, and the resurrection is part of the hope that a believer has in Christ. Thus, we can say that the Lord is coming again, and he said of the times and the seasons we know, but that of the day and the hour no one knows, for the Lord comes as a thief in the night. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came, and took them all ways. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And that's what Breaker is trying to tell us here. So when Jesus showed up in his earthly ministry before he died on the cross, who did he come to? Well, Jesus says clearly in Matthew 15, 24, he said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus dogmatically makes it clear, here in my ministry, I am only here for Jews, nobody else those early disciples went out preaching, their ministry was only to Jews as well. Their ministry in the Bible is called the Apostles' Doctrine. Now, I've got a video on that, the Apostles' Doctrine. Because today we have the Apostle Paul. Why is Paul in the Bible? Because the Jews rejected their Messiah. You see, the Apostles' Doctrine was repent be baptized and do right because you killed your Messiah. That's not the gospel of today. We don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that gets us saved and go to heaven. Now, we should know and believe that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel, but the very fact that I believe Jesus is the Messiah, that's not what gets me to heaven. What gets me to heaven is trusting the gospel that God revealed unto Paul. 
Jesus used parables and analogies to communicate truth referencing events and traditions the people of his day recognized. The Jews of the first century would have been very familiar with the traditional Jewish betrothal and wedding traditions which Jesus utilized to emphasize his relationship to the church, that is, true believers. The predominant symbolism is that of a bride which is analogous to the church, Revelations chapter 18 through 22. Many other Jewish wedding analogies are woven through scriptures painting a picture of Christ's love for his bride, the church. In John 14, 1-6, Jesus tells his followers that he is leaving to prepare a place for them in his Lord's house, and that he will return to take them with him. This is the identical commitment made by the Jewish bridegroom to his bride at the Jewish betrothal described above. The bridegroom and bride become engaged, and the bridegroom leaves for a while to build a room on his Lord's property before the wedding. At the end of a time period known only to God, the groom arrives for his bride and transport her to the wedding feast. Thus, the rapture is the fulfillment of Jesus' promise to his disciples in John 14. It is the unexpected rapture of the Church of Jesus Christ, which is made up of his sincere believers and followers. As foretold, Acts 1, 9-11, Jesus will appear in the air before the last days of tribulation and take the bride to his mansion in heaven. Another thing that Breaker talks about are the dispensations, which means a system of order, government, or organization of a nation or community, especially as existing at a particular time. The kind of dispensation he's talking about here is called the dispensation of grace. The dispensation of grace began with Jesus Christ's resurrection and continues today. The new covenant is based on Christ's blood, Luke 22:20. This is also known as the Age of Grace, or the Church Age, and the scholars think that the full dispensation, which is more than 2,000 years, takes place between the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9.24. During this era, we also have a comforter with us, the Holy Spirit of God, who lives within Christians, John 14.16-26. Dispensationalists believe that the Church Age will conclude with the rapture of the Church, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and Revelations 3, 10, followed by the tribulation, which will last seven years and bring God's wrath to those who live on earth, Daniel 12, 1 through 4, and Matthew 24, 21 through 27. The exact timing of the rapture is hotly debated, although dispensationalists believe it will occur at the start of the seven years. We do know that some people will be saved throughout the tribulation, Revelation 7, 14 through 17, and it will conclude with the Battle of the Armageddon, when Jesus Christ will return and defeat Satan and all who would follow, which is something that is being described by Breaker as well. He clearly gives an answer to all those who don't believe in the rapture and don't call it a biblical event, because according to Breaker and according to our faith, Paul did see the rapture and called it one of the events that will eventually take place. Thus, it is very important for all of us to believe in it as the believers of Jesus Christ. Postponement theory. If you haven't seen that, please look up the postponement theory. And what it is, is when Jesus Christ came, he came to Israel with a promise to set up a millennial kingdom for a thousand years and reign over them. But his ministry, he was rejected by the Jews. And he sent his disciples, the apostles, out, and they rejected him as, them as well. And Israel as a nation rejected their Messiah. And so God started what I like to call a parenthetical thing. He set this thing up in such a way that the Jews were set aside and the kingdom was postponed. And now God's going and dealing more with Gentiles. Now, yes, Jews can still be saved. And by the way, the body of Christ starts at the cross, okay? But because of the rejection, here's where this postponement, Acts chapter 8. Now, according to Breaker, when Jesus died on the cross, his body was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, Matthew 27, 57 through 60, and his soul went to paradise, where he had an appointment that day to meet the soul of the penitent thief, Luke 23, 43, whose corpse was buried in the potter's field. They met in paradise while still in their soulish bodies. This is clear from other scriptures. According to what has been said, with Jesus' resurrection, the soul of the righteous dead have gone to paradise of the third heaven, 
where they can be with the Lord. They will remain there until the rapture of the church, when they will return with Jesus, and while he tarries in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, they will return to the earth and re-enter their resurrected and glorified bodies, because we read that when Jesus returns, he will bring with him the souls of those who sleep in Jesus. The expression, sleep in Jesus, is a term applied only to the bodies of the righteous dead, and signifies that we are to think of the bodies of the dead in Christ as only sleeping or resting. While paradise, as a suburb of heaven, and we must remember that, while the souls of the righteous in paradise are free of sorrow and sickness and enjoy the company of saints of all ages, their state is more one of rest and waiting than of activity or service, Revelation 6, 9-11, through because they have not yet received their resurrection body with all of its glorious powers, nor have they been judged so that they can receive their reward or crown if they are entitled to one. According to Breaker, the description of heaven and the New Jerusalem as given in the book of Revelation is still future, and the things described will not come to pass until after the rapture of the church. This explains what the apostle means when he says, We groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Romans 8, 18 through 23 And because this is not possible until the return of the Lord Jesus, who will then change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body? Philippians 3, 20 through 21. We should be doing everything we can to hasten his return. And that is what Breaker is trying to tell us here. Because God revealed the mystery of the rapture to Paul. So if you throw Paul out of the Bible, then of course you're not going to believe in the rapture. All you're going to believe in is the words of Jesus. And when Jesus was speaking in Matthew 24, he was speaking of his coming, of the second stage of his coming. He was speaking of Armageddon. Jesus wasn't speaking of the rapture here in Matthew chapter 24. Other people say, well, this is the rapture. Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the rapture. Now, wait a minute. How can Jesus be speaking of the rapture in Matthew 24, if that's back here before he died, if the rapture had not been revealed yet to the Apostle Paul way over here. Matter of fact, many people today have learned that the Jews have a feast. And one of the feasts of the Jews is the Feast of Trumpets. And I don't have time to get into the feast today, but there's seven feasts in the Bible, and Jesus Christ fulfills all seven of those feasts throughout his entire ministry and life. The final thing that Breaker talks about is the timing of the events that are being described by Paul. According to him, one of the arguments against the doctrine of the second coming of Christ is the assertion that he could return at any time. Postmillennialists argue that the writers of the New Testament expected him to return in their time, and that the fact that he did not is proof that they were erroneous, and that Paul later changed his views about the imminence of Christ's return. It is true that when Jesus said, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord will come, Therefore be prepared, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24, 42-44 He did not teach in these verses that he would return during the lifetime of those who listened to him. In fact, in his parables, he hinted that his return might be delayed, as in the parable of the talents, which states, After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh. Matthew 25:19. What Jesus wished to emphasize was the rapid and unexpected nature of his return. But this does talk about his return and the rapture as being described by Robert Breaker. According to him, one should not be confused about the rapture whether it will take place or not, because we as believers know that this biblical event will eventually take place. According to Breaker, Satan has been busy intensifying the operation of his ministry of misinformation. He is going about setting up his lying machines like never before, producing and circulating counterfeit information about the truth and the messengers of the Lord Jesus Christ who preach and teach the truth. All of the enemy's attempts are intended solely to deceive you about the truth of the rapture. Satan doesn't care what you believe about the rapture as long as it's not true. Anything Satan does to keep you from excitedly anticipating the Lord Jesus Christ during the rapture is a success for him. If he can stop you from knowing the truth about it, be careful that he does not also stop you from going into the rapture. If he can prevent you from letting the notion of the rapture impact how you live your life today, 
be wary that he will also prevent you from being among those raptured. Thus, it is very important for us to have the right information about the rapture, and that is what Breaker is trying to tell us here.